Welcome to the Bible and Theology Matters podcast, where we discuss all things Bible and theology. Because it matters, what you really believe determines how you really behave. Now, here is your host, Associate Professor of Bible Exposition at Dallas Theological Seminary and Professor of Bible and Theology for the National Theological College and Graduate School, Dr. Paul Weaver. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, whatever time it is when you are watching or listening to this podcast. I'm your host, Paul Weaver, and on this podcast, it's my great pleasure to lead conversations about all things Bible and theology with some of my favorite Bible scholars and Bible expositors. And I'm pleased to have back on the program this week, Dr. Michael Gleghorn. Dr. Gleghorn is a professor at Grand Canyon University, where he is an instructor of Christian worldview. Prior to that, he was a research associate at Probe Ministries for many years. Dr. Gleghorn earned his Bachelor of Arts from Baylor University, his Master of Theology from Dallas Theological Seminary, and his Ph.D. in Theological Studies also from Dallas Theological Seminary. Today, we are continuing our conversation with Dr. Gleghorn about extra-biblical or non-canonical sources that speak about the person of Jesus of Nazareth. Dr. Gleghorn, would you give us a quick overview of the material that we discussed in our last episode? Yes, last week we began talking about some of this ancient evidence for Jesus from non-Christian sources, and we looked at two ancient Roman sources that actually both date to the early 2nd century. Um, So the first of these was Tacitus, the Roman historian Tacitus, who in his Annals, mentions Jesus and the early Christians, and that was published around 115 AD. And then the second source that we considered was Pliny the Younger, who also mentions the early Christians, and particularly the fact that they worshiped Jesus as if he were a god, and mentions this in a letter to Emperor Trajan around 111 or 112 AD. So both of these sources are early Roman non-Christian sources dating from the early 2nd century. Very good. Well, our conversation on this program is following the outline of an article that Dr. Gleghorn wrote for Probe Ministries. You can go to probe.org to read that article, and it's basically the same title of our episode today, Ancient Evidence for Jesus from Non-Christian Sources. And so we're going to continue our conversation today by first discussing the Babylonian Talmud. I find it very interesting that the Babylonian Talmud, a uniquely Jewish writing, references Jesus of Nazareth. Please explain first what the Babylonian Talmud is, Dr. Gleghorn. Yes, the Babylonian Talmud is a collection of Jewish writings, and these date from approximately 70 AD or thereabouts to around 500 AD. And what it consists of is is what's called the Mishnah and the Gemara. And so the Mishnah is oral law or oral Torah. Of course, it's oral until it's written down, um, but uh, it was written down at this time. And then the Gemara is basically commentary on the Mishnah. So it basically includes uh, Jewish religious traditions, um, oral law, and commentary on these. And there are different time periods in which these writings occur. As I said, we've got everything from around 70 to 500 AD, but in an earlier section that dates from around AD 70 to AD 200, uh, there's an interesting passage that appears to reference, at least many scholars believe it references, Jesus. And that is found in what's called Sanhedrin 43a. So I'm going to read the portion of the Babylonian Talmud now that includes a discussion about Jesus, and then would love for your, Dr. Gleghorn, your comments on the other side. Now I'm quoting the Talmud. On the eve of the Passover, Yeshua was hanged. For 40 days before the execution took place, a herald went forth and cried, He is going forth to be stoned because he has practiced sorcery and enticed Israel to apostasy. I guess I should maybe start by saying that this mentions Yeshu, or sometimes Yeshua, and 
So some people might be wondering, well, why do scholars believe that this may refer to Jesus? And the reason is, is because Yeshua, Yeshua, is Jesus' name in Hebrew. So this is just simply the Hebrew equivalent for the name Jesus, or in the Greek, Jesus. This is one of the reasons why scholars believe that this passage may concern the actual New Testament Jesus. And so the first thing it does is it gives us a date. It says on the eve of Passover, Yeshua was hanged. So it tells us when Jesus was executed. Now, some people might wonder about this term hanged, because in our culture, of course, you know, we're familiar with the old Westerns and so forth, in which someone is strung up by the neck until dead. And people might be thinking, well, Jesus wasn't hanged. He was crucified. In this ancient context, this is just another way of referring to the crucifixion of Jesus. And although it's not the normal way of doing so, we do find this way of referring to crucifixion, even in the Bible itself. And so let me just give a couple of examples. In Paul's letter to the Galatians, Galatians 3.13, we can read this. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. And so there Paul uses the term hanged, Um, And this, of course, is even coming from Deuteronomy, Um, but he uses the term hang to refer to the crucifixion of Jesus. In addition, in Luke's gospel, when Luke is referring to the execution of the two criminals who were crucified along with Jesus, he says this, one of the criminals who were hanged railed at him saying, are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. And so here we also see Luke using this term hanged. So When the Babylonian Talmud refers to Yeshu being hanged on the eve of Passover, it's referring to him being crucified on the eve of Passover. This was just another way of referring to the crucifixion of Jesus. So those are two very interesting things that the Babylonian Talmud gives us right there is is a date for when the execution took place as as well as the means of execution. And then also the name Yeshu, this is one of the reasons why many scholars think that this could be an actual reference in the Babylonian Talmud to Jesus of Nazareth. The Gospels make it very clear that Jesus was hung on Passover weekend. And that was by no means by chance, was it? Jesus is that Passover lamb that Old Testament Passover feast was pointing forward to. He was the spotless lamb, the substitutionary atonement for our sins. The Gospels inform us that the soldiers broke the legs of the criminals crucified along with Jesus to speed up their death so that they could be taken down before the Passover Sabbath. And when they came to Jesus to break his legs, he was already dead. So they didn't break his legs, just as Psalm 3420 predicted. The Messiah's legs would not be broken. So the details recorded in the Talmud affirms the historicity of of the gospel records. One of the things that's also interesting about this passage is it mentions how for 40 days before the execution took place, a herald went forth and cried, he is going forth to be stoned because he has practiced sorcery and enticed Israel to apostasy. Now, we don't have any record of this in the New Testament gospels of some herald going forth shortly before Jesus' crucifixion, saying that he's going to be stoned. But this does seem consistent with what the Jewish religious leaders may have initially been planning. We do find records in the gospels in which the Jews, because of statements that Jesus made, for instance, in the gospel of John, I and the father are one, and they pick up stones to stone him. And Jesus even asked them what they're doing. They said, you know, we're going to stone you for blasphemy because you, being a man, are claiming to be God. And so this would be consistent with what the Jews may have been planning, but the way things ended up working out, Roman involvement may have changed those plans. It's like now the Romans are involved, and so now we'll just vote for his crucifixion. So that's that's another thing that I find interesting. But then also the fact that it, this source, which is clearly hostile to Jesus, this is not a source that is favorable to Jesus, but is clearly hostile to Jesus. It accuses him of practicing sorcery and enticing Israel to apostasy. So this is coming from some of the early enemies of Jesus. But what's interesting to me is that if we read between the lines, the fact that they're accusing Jesus of practicing sorcery 
seems to imply that they recognize that he did wonderful things, that he was actually someone that performed miraculous feats, and that these miraculous feats were so well known that they really couldn't be easily denied. This was so well known that to try to deny it would have made you appear to be an unreliable source. And so they don't deny that he did these miraculous things. Rather, they attribute them these miraculous feats to sorcery rather than to the power of God. So the New Testament gospels attribute this to the power of God in Jesus, but the Babylonian Talmud, rather than deny that he did these miraculous feats, attributes them to sorcery, to some sort of dark arts. So that's an interesting thing that goes, again, to confirm the picture of Jesus that we have in the New Testament, if we read between the lines, recognizing that this is coming from the enemies of Jesus and that they're just attributing to sorcery what the New Testament Gospels attributes to the power of God, his miraculous deeds. But then in addition to that, it also mentions Jesus enticing Israel to apostasy. And this seems to be another way of referring to Jesus' powerful teaching ministry, that he was gaining disciples among the Jewish people, and that the Jewish religious leaders were becoming increasingly unnerved by that. Again, rather than seeing him as a legitimate representative of God and someone coming and speaking in the place of God, they say that he's leading Israel to apostasy. But they aren't challenging the fact that Jesus had a powerful teaching ministry and that many people were persuaded by what he had to say and were becoming his disciples. Very good. Very interesting, of course. It's also interesting that if you go to the Israel Museum today in Jerusalem, you can view the Caiaphas ossuary, or also pronounced ossuary, which is a very ornate limestone bone box where archaeologists agree the bones of Caiaphas of the first century were placed. This is the very same Caiaphas that led the illegal religious trials of Jesus at night. The Israel Museum is very honest in their recognition that Caiaphas was the instigator of the trial of Jesus of Nazareth. They don't deny that it occurred, and it's a bit of a blight in their history, but they don't deny that Jesus was killed in this way, just as Josephus tells us, just as the Babylonian Talmud tells us, and all this affirms what the four Gospels record for us. That's one of the things that I think is particularly interesting about this is that it comes from a hostile witness, and yet when you kind of read between the lines, you still find a number of things that go to confirm what the New Testament Gospels tell us about the life, ministry, and death of Jesus. Hello, friends. I want to take just a few moments of your time to share with you a quick prayer request for Jill and myself. Jill and I have been thinking and praying about how to get the Bible and Theology Matters podcast to the next level in terms of ministering to more people and being more effective. Currently, my wife and I are the bottleneck, limiting our effectiveness. We are a two-man show. We're doing all the planning, all the recording, all the editing, and social media posts. Not because we think we're the best at it, and not because we want to per se, but simply because of financial constraints. We simply don't have the financial giving at this point to contract out the editing or social media work. The Bible and Theology Matters podcast is not making money, nor is that our goal. Our goal is to have the greatest influence we can for the glory of God with good Bible and theology. Because we are 100% committed to the fact that what you really believe impacts how you really behave. It's not just a slogan. Bible and theology really does matter. So we're trying to raise a meager $500 of monthly giving. This will allow us to contract out some of the work that's keeping us from doing more for the glory of God. So if you think the Bible and Theology Matters podcast is accomplishing a good thing and it's been a blessing to you, would you prayerfully consider giving just $10, maybe $25, $50, maybe $100 a month to this cause? you'll receive a tax-deductible receipt. You can go to BibleAndTheologyMatters.com and click on the Give link. To learn more, go to BibleAndTheologyMatters.com. Or maybe you have skills in audio and video editing or social media and would be willing to donate your time. That, too, would be an incredible blessing. You can reach out to me directly at pweaver at dts.edu. That's P for Paul, pweaver at dts.edu. 
Thank you for your consideration. Now back to our previous conversation with Dr. Gleghorn. All right. Well, next, I'd love for us to talk about an interesting fellow by the name of Josephus. He's Jewish. He's a historian. But can you tell us a little bit more about Josephus Flavius before we look at his writings about Jesus of Nazareth. Yeah, Josephus is a first century Jewish historian, and the passage that we'll be looking at comes from a work that he wrote called The Antiquities of the Jews, in which he basically traces the history of the Jewish people from creation all the way up until his own day. In the Antiquities, there are two references to Jesus. Now, what's interesting about the Antiquities is that this was written probably around 95 AD, so toward the end of the first century, um, around the same time that many scholars believe the Gospel of John was written. So um, if that's correct, then these would be roughly contemporaneous documents. But Josephus was a, a Jewish historian who uh, wrote several works, and the one that we'll be looking at, in which Jesus is mentioned twice, is called The Antiquities of the Jews. Dr. Gleghorn, Josephus was certainly an intriguing, interesting figure, wasn't he? He was a supporter of the Jewish revolt against Rome in AD 66. And then, well, he realized he was on the losing side and he joined Rome. Yeah, he, he surrendered to Vespasian and actually became the court historian of Vespasian, or at least one of them, and then was able to devote the rest of his life in comfortable circumstances, one would suppose, doing research and writing the history of the Jews. So let me read Josephus Flavius's words, and then Dr. Gleghorn, you can uh, explain the details. Now there was about this time Jesus, a wise man, if it be lawful to call him a man, for he was a doer of wonderful works, a teacher of such men as received the truth with pleasure. He drew over to him both many of the Jews and many of the Gentiles. He was the Christ. And when Pilate, at the suggestion of the principal men amongst us, had condemned him to the cross, those that loved him at the first did not forsake him, for he appeared to them alive again the third day as the divine prophets had foretold, these and 10,000 other wonderful things concerning him and the tribe of Christians so named from him are not extinct at this day. Well, Dr. Gleghorn, there's a lot to unpack there, isn't there? Yes, there is. And I guess the first thing that I should say is that you know, just what you read there is a very astonishing statement. And there could be members of the audience who are thinking, wow, I mean, Josephus sounds like he was a Christian. And so that's something that we've got to unpack a little bit. There are basically three scholarly views on this passage. One would say the passage as you read it is one that was written by Josephus, and all of it goes back to Josephus himself. One that would basically deny that any of this is from Josephus. And then a mediating position, which would be held by the majority of scholars today. So this would be the the major scholarly position on this passage is that the core of this passage is authentically Josephus, that the core of this passage really does go back to Josephus. Josephus himself did write it, but with this qualification, that there are additions that appear to have been made by later Christian copyists that inserted certain phrases into this passage that go to make Josephus sound like a Christian. And the evidence that we have suggests that Josephus wasn't a Christian. He, he doesn't give us any reason to believe that if we question you know, some of the segments of this passage. And Origen mentions that Josephus, whom he was familiar with, at least in part, tells us that Josephus was not a Christian. And Origen is an early church father and would be in a better position to know than we would. And so if we go back and we begin to take this passage apart piece by piece, what I'll do is I'll reread it and I'll let the audience know where we appear to have Christian additions or Christian interpolations. About this time, there lived Jesus, a wise man. And most scholars would say that is authentically Josephus. Josephus refers to Jesus and he refers to Jesus as a wise man. And Jesus had that reputation. This would really simply be reporting the facts on the ground as Josephus would have understood them. Um, but then he has this parenthetical phrase, if indeed one ought to call him a man, which makes it sound as if Jesus was more than human. And most scholars would say 
insofar as this makes it sound as if Jesus, Jesus were more than human, that Josephus probably did not write this. So this seems to be a later Christian addition to the passage. He then continues, for he was one who wrought surprising feats and was a teacher of such people as accept the truth gladly. All of that, they would say, is authentically Josephus. That's just, again, a basically factual report of the historical Jesus. He goes on to say he won over many Jews and many of the Greeks, and this too would be authentically Josephus. But then he has this phrase, he was the Christ, in which he explicitly affirms that Jesus is the Jewish Messiah, the promised Messiah. And since Josephus wasn't a Christian, it is very unlikely that he would come out and say that. And in fact, later, in a later passage where he mentions the execution of Jesus' brother James, he refers to Jesus as the so-called Christ, one who is said to have been the Christ. And so there, scholars don't tend to question that that passage is authentically Josephus, but there he doesn't call Jesus the Christ. He says, refers to him as the so-called Christ or he who is called the Christ, but he doesn't explicitly affirm he was the Christ as he seems to do here. And so most scholars would say that this pa- this this explicit affirmation of him being the Christ is a later Christian addition. He then continues, when Pilate, upon hearing him accused by men of the highest standing among us, had condemned him to be crucified, those who had in the first place come to love him did not give up their affection for him, all authentically Josephus. This tells us that Jesus was crucified under Pontius Pilate, that he had been accused by men of the highest standing among the Jewish religious leaders and had been condemned to death and crucified, and that his followers continued to follow him and didn't give up their affection and their love for him, all authentically Josephus. But then you have this phrase, you have this statement, on the third day, he appeared to them restored to life. For the prophets of God had prophesied these and countless other marvelous things about him. And insofar as this is an explicit affirmation of the resurrection of Jesus, again, scholars think it's very unlikely that Josephus wrote this because, again, this is an explicit affirmation of the resurrection of Jesus. And Josephus wouldn't have written this. This seems to be a later Christian edition. But then he concludes with these words, and the tribe of Christians, so-called after him, has still to this day not disappeared. And that, again, would be authentically Josephus. And you see that Josephus uses language that would be unlikely of a Christian to use here in this final sentence, referring to the tribe of Christians. But he says, so-called after him, which reminds us again of Tacitus, you know, that the Christians received their name from one Christus, after whom they have their name. So basically, you have kind of a mixture of phrases and sentences that go back to Josephus, most scholars would believe combined with things that seem to have been inserted by later Christian copyists who were copying Josephus and transmitting him down to later historical ages, but adding in some thoughts and ideas of their own that made Josephus sound like a Christian here. So if we strip away everything that we may not think is original, let's go with what the majority of scholars, what we can learn about the historical Jesus from this section of the Antiquities of the Jews written by Josephus Flavius. Well, we can learn quite a bit. You notice that he begins by referring to Jesus as a wise man. So according to Josephus, a first century Jewish historian, when he comes to talk about Jesus, the first thing he mentions is that Jesus was regarded as wise. And that, of course, is certainly consistent with what the New Testament Gospels tell us. He goes on to tell us that he wrought surprising feats, which could be a reference to Jesus' miraculous wonders. And some people might be surprised that Josephus would record this, but of course, there were other people at the time who were reported to have done miraculous deeds, and so it wouldn't be implausible, something that was well-known, that Jesus was a well-known wonder worker and miracle worker, and that Josephus could bear witness to this. We read that he was a teacher of such people as accept the truth gladly, and that he won over many of the Jews and many of the Gentiles. And that would all be just, again, a matter of common knowledge that Jesus did get disciples, both from the Jews and then after his death and resurrection, he gained a large following among the Gentiles. And that this would be something that Josephus could know as a historian and report just matter-of-factly, all of which is consistent with what the New Testament tells us. Then he tells us that when Pilate, 
upon hearing him accused by men of the highest standing amongst us, had condemned him to be crucified. Those who had in the first place come to love him did not give up their affection for him. And so this tells us, again, this bears witness to the fact that Jesus was crucified under Pontius Pilate. And Josephus tells us that, and that's consistent with what the New Testament Gospels record. At least in the 10th century Arabic version, he tells us that the disciples reported that Jesus appeared to them alive after three days. And so there he could be bearing witness to the fact that the disciples reported the resurrection of Jesus without telling us that he himself embraced this. This is just what the disciples said. And then finally, that the tribe of Christians, uh, so-called after him, has still to this day not disappeared, that, that the Christians continue to be followers of Jesus and continue to worship Jesus and regard him as a wise teacher that they continue to follow even to this day at the end of the first century. So these would all be things that we learn from Josephus, which are consistent with what the New Testament has to tell us about Jesus and early Christianity. Very nice. Again, Josephus has no reason to record these details except for the sake of posterity. He's not seeking to promote Christianity, that's for sure, just to be a historian and record the facts from his perspective. Yes, that's exactly right. Um, as we mentioned in the previous episode, Josephus, among the sources that we're considering now, seems to probably be the most neutral of the sources. Once we take out the Christian editions, as we mentioned, he, he seems to be quite neutral, but he seems to be just reporting matter-of-factly as a first century Jewish historian what some of his people had come to believe about a first century Jewish rabbi whom who was crucified under Pontius Pilate and who at least in the 10th century Arabic version, his disciples reported that he had been then raised from the dead after being crucified. And so, yeah, he seems to just be reporting this matter-of-factly as things that some of his Jewish countrymen had come to believe about this man, Jesus. Well, before we move on, I would also like just to point out that Josephus also mentions the killing of James, the half-brother of Jesus. Now, the Gospels make it clear that James was not a follower of Jesus until after the resurrection. And that's one of the lines of evidence for the resurrection that Dr. Gary Habermas, who happens to be one of the foremost experts on the resurrection, repeats often. In other words, he argues the fact that James, the brother of Jesus or half-brother of Jesus, who was not a believer of Jesus as the Messiah before his death, but after seeing the resurrected Christ, he became a believer and ultimately dies for Christ. That's strong evidence for the resurrection. Yes. Yeah. I I think that that's a very powerful argument. I remember hearing William Lane Craig, who's also an expert, as you know, on the historicity of the resurrection of Jesus. I remember him speaking one time and he asked the question, you know, how many of you have brother? And he's like, what would it take for you to believe, to come to believe that your brother was the Lord and to come to believe that so strongly that you would be willing to die for that belief? I mean, it's just such a bizarre thing, and yet that's the position that James was in. He wasn't a believer in Jesus during his earthly life, as we know from passages in the Gospel of Mark and the Gospel of John, and yet after Jesus' death and resurrection, he comes to believe in Jesus and believe in him so strongly that he's ultimately willing to die for a martyr, believing that his brother is the Christ, the promised Messiah, who has you know, come from God and died for the sins of the world and all the rest. And so, yeah, it is, it's a very powerful argument, I think. So our listeners can check out Josephus Antiquities. That's in chapter 20, section 200. So in chapter 20, it mentions that he's brought before the Sanhedrin and he's handed over to be stoned because he's a so-called breaker of the law. Well, very good. Well, let's talk about one last author, and that is Lucian. Dr. Gleghorn, who is Lucian? Lucian is a little bit different. This is a second century Greek satirist. Um, and we the, the passage that we'll look at uh, comes from a work called The Death of Peregrine or The Death of Peregrinus. And it dates to probably around 165 AD. So this is in the second half of the second century. This is a little bit later, you notice, than Tacitus or Pliny or Josephus. Um, it could be roughly around the time, you know, consistent with the time of the Babylonian Talmud passage that we looked at. But this is a little bit later, and this comes from a Greek author. And as I said, he's a satirist, and he's basically in the passage that we'll be looking at, he's kind of mocking 
the Christians. Although, interestingly enough, even as he mocks them, some of what he says you know, shows the admirableness of the Christians in certain ways. So let me read Lucian's words, and then Dr. Gleghorn, uh, you can comment upon them. The Christians, they worship a man to this day, the distinguished personage who introduced their novel rites and was crucified on that account. It was impressed on them by their original lawgiver that they are all brothers from the moment that they are converted and deny the gods of Greece and worship the crucified sage and live after his laws. Yes. Yeah. So you notice that he's talking about the Christians here, and he says that they worship a man to this day. So at this time, in the second half of the second century, we find uh, another hostile witness, a witness who's not a Christian and who is not sympathetic to Christianity, who is telling us that the Christians are worshiping this historical person as a god. It, it kind of goes along with what Pliny told us previously. So recognizing that this person, Jesus of Nazareth, was an actual historical individual and that the Christians have begun to worship him as divine. And so this tells us that the early Christians were worshiping one whom we regard as both divine and human, one person with two natures, uh, divine nature, which he's had from all eternity, and then a human nature, which he takes to himself at the time of the incarnation. And Lucian is testifying to the fact that these Christians, in worshiping this man, they, they clearly regard him as divine in some sense, or they wouldn't be worshiping him. And yet they're worshiping basically a God-man. Dr. Gleghorn, Lucian mentions novel rites, some new ideas and teachings that are unique, which that's definitely true to what we read in the Gospels. And then he was indeed crucified on account of those novel or new teachings. Yes, and it, it is important to notice just how many of these accounts tell us that Jesus was crucified. This is one of the best established facts about Jesus is that he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. And here we have Lucian. We've seen that Tacitus bears witness to this. Josephus bears witness to this. Pliny is at least familiar with it. Lucian also lets us know that the that Jesus was crucified on account of some of these novel rites and teachings. So yeah, he, he bears witness to the crucifixion of Jesus as well. It is interesting that Lucian goes on to talk about the Christian's belief in the afterlife. Please elaborate, Dr. Gleghorn. Yeah, yeah. And he goes on to talk a little bit about that. He you know, says that these misguided creatures start with the general conviction that they are immortal for all time which explains the contempt of death and voluntary self-devotion, which are so common among them. And so it is interesting. Like I said, this comes from, a, again, a hostile source that isn't sympathetic to the early Christians. And yet he does kind of tip his hat to them in a sense, you know, recognizing their contempt of death, that the Christians were not afraid to die for their faith. He goes on to say that they, it was impressed on them by their original lawgiver, referring to Jesus, that they are all brothers from the moment that they are converted and deny the gods of Greece and worship the crucified sage and live after his laws. And so, you know, he doesn't get things, you know, completely right in all respects, but it is interesting just hearing what this contemporary non, this, you know, non-Christian from the middle of the second century is saying, because he recognizes that they have an actual conversion experience from the moment that they're converted to faith in Christ, things are different. Allegiance has changed. They deny the gods of Greece now. Their allegiance is exclusively to Jesus. They are followers of him. They worship the crucified sage. So he bears witness to the fact that you know Jesus was regarded as a sage, that he was regarded as a wise man, again, bearing witness to his crucifixion, and that the Christians worshiped this crucified sage and live after his laws, trying to implement the teachings of Jesus and and apply them to their lives and live according to his teachings. And so, yeah, all of this would be consistent in a general way with what the New Testament has to tell us. Dr. Gleghorn, earlier you repeated the question of the well-known apologist named William Lane Craig. William Lane Craig asked what it would take for you to worship your brother. Well, in the case of James, it took James seeing the resurrected Christ. I would add to that question, what would it take for you to be willing to worship a man who was killed 
and died the most humiliating death reserved for the worst of criminals, the death of crucifixion. The Jewish people were not looking to follow a man, let alone worship a man who would die. That's not what they're expecting, a crucified Messiah. They were expecting a conquering king. But yet, they were worshiping a crucified man because they had seen the resurrected Christ. Your natural predisposition would not be to worship your brother, and it certainly would not be to worship a crucified man. But when you see the resurrected Christ, that changes everything. Well, all these sources that we have been looking at are extra-biblical or non-canonical sources from ancient 1st and 2nd century authors. We could look at several others, Celsus, who was a Roman philosopher, Thallus, a 1st century historian, also a slave that wrote he was freed slave, and another source called Marabar Serapion, who, as a Roman citizen, mentions Jesus in a letter to his son. So these are several other sources in just the first two centuries that we could, if we had the time, delve into. But Dr. Gleghorn, you and I were talking earlier, before I hit the record button, that it's interesting that there are are only nine surviving sources from the first 150 years that mention Tiberius Caesar during that time. And that is the Roman emperor, only nine. And yet we have 10 non-biblical sources non-Christian sources. If we were to add the Christian and biblical sources, we'd have over 43 sources that mention Jesus before 150 AD. So to restate this clearly, we have at least 34 more sources that reference Jesus in the first 150 years than sources that reference Caesar, who's the emperor of the Roman Empire. So that declares loudly the incredible impact that Jesus of Nazareth made. And all of this information can be found in Norm Geisler and Frank Turk's book, I Don't Have Enough Faith to Be an Atheist. Our regular listeners will recall that Dr. Frank Turk was on this program a couple times to discuss the contents of that book, I Don't Have Enough Faith to Be an Atheist. You know, we've been considering in this program ancient evidence for Jesus from non-Christian sources. But of course, there are, in addition to these non-Christian sources, there are also ancient Christian sources outside of the Bible, people like Clement of Rome and Ignatius of Antioch and Justin Martyr and others that we could also appeal to. But then there's the New Testament documents themselves. And unlike most of the sources that we've considered today, the New Testament documents are all dated to within the first century, whereas with the sources we've considered today, only Josephus makes that cut. But the New Testament documents are all dated to within the first century. And the New Testament documents, including the New Testament Gospels, would actually be our earliest, best historical sources of information about the life, ministry, death, and resurrection of Jesus. So, and this is something that's agreed upon by pretty much all scholars. Uh, This isn't an area of dispute, that our earliest and best sources of information for the historical Jesus are the New Testament Gospels and the other New Testament writings themselves. So while today we've considered ancient non-Christian evidence for Jesus, which is interesting and important to consider, it is important to remember, you know, within the broader context of the documentation that we have, that actually our earliest and best historical sources are the ones found in the New Testament. That's that's the best, those are the best sources that we've got. And these ancient non-Christian sources are just kind of icing on the cake. They just help to add additional information and confirm in skeletal outline much of what the New Testament has to tell us about Jesus and early Christianity. But they themselves are not the best and earliest witnesses. Those are found in the New Testament. Excellent point. And the reason we're having this conversation is because most people aren't familiar with these sources we're talking about today. And so it's helpful and interesting to investigate these in greater detail. But as Dr. Daniel Wallace says often, a colleague of mine at Dallas Theological Seminary, about the plethora of New Testament manuscripts, the same is true of the extra-biblical evidence for Jesus, we have an embarrassment of riches. Well, Dr. Gleghorn, as we wrap up this podcast, what are some takeaways from this discussion? What are some thoughts that you would have, challenges for the believer, both in terms of our own personal confidence, but also in terms of our efforts to share with someone who might be skeptical of Christianity? Well, I think that this information can be helpful in sharing with somebody that might be skeptical of Christianity, for it allows us to begin the conversation with 
non-Christian sources, many of which were not only not sympathetic to Jesus in early Christianity, but hostile to Jesus in early Christianity, and yet go to confirm in outline form much of what we read about in the New Testament Gospels themselves. And so I think that that is a good point to make just right from the beginning. Then we can follow that up by pointing out that, you know, if the New Testament Gospels are accurate and, you know, consistent with what these ancient non-Christian sources have to tell us about Jesus and early Christianity, when we can check them, then shouldn't we give them the benefit of the doubt when we can't? When we can check them against other ancient sources, we find that they're good and they're accurate. So if we don't have other ancient sources to check them against, shouldn't we take them for their word and give them the benefit of the doubt? It seems to me that that would be the more honest and fair thing to do in that situation. Just thinking about the sources that we've considered over the last couple of episodes, I did want to conclude by tying this all together. And here's how I concluded my article. I said, let's summarize what we've learned about Jesus from this examination of ancient non-Christian sources. First, Both Josephus and Lucian indicate that Jesus was regarded as wise. Second, Pliny, the Talmud, and Lucian imply he was a powerful and revered teacher. Third, both Josephus and the Talmud indicate he performed miraculous feats. Fourth, Tacitus, Josephus, the Talmud, and Lucian all mention that he was crucified. Tacitus and Josephus say this occurred under Pontius Pilate and the Talmud declares it happened on the eve of Passover. Fifth, there are possible references to the Christian belief in Jesus' resurrection in both Tacitus, as we saw, and Josephus. Sixth, Josephus records that Jesus' followers believed he was the Christ or Messiah. And finally, both Pliny and Lucian indicate that Christians worshipped Jesus as God or as a God, as they would say in kind of their pagan polytheistic context, but they recognized that Christians were worshipping him as divine. When you put all this together, I think we can see just how much extra biblical non-Christian information from ancient sources of the first and second century, how much confirmation these sources give us of the broad outline of what the New Testament has to say about Jesus and early Christians. So I do find this to be interesting and an encouraging evidence and evidence that we can share with our non-Christian friends and neighbors and encourage them then to explore the New Testament gospels for themselves. If truth is on our side, and it is, then we'd expect the historical account to affirm it. And it does. We have a reasonable faith. It's not just a step of blind faith as some other religions are, but this is based on history, facts, and the historical Jesus. Yeah, and... You know, what we've considered today is just the tip of the iceberg in one particular area. I mean, it in so many areas, you can just go very deep. And yeah, it, it really is a very reasonable faith and a response to very good evidence that the Lord has seen fit to provide us. Well, very good, Dr. Gleghorn. Thanks again for joining me for this edition of the Bible and Theology Matters podcast, this two-part series. My pleasure, Paul. Thanks for having me. And to our listeners, it's been great to have you listening in, joining our conversation. I'd encourage you to head over to Probe Ministries or probe.org and download the article that Michael wrote, Dr. Gleghorn wrote on this subject. It's entitled Ancient Evidence for Jesus from Non-Christian Sources. And I hope you'll join us again for our next episode. We release a new episode every Thursday morning. And make sure you check out our YouTube channel. Head over to YouTube and in the search browser, simply type Bible and, that's A-N-D, Theology Matters, or go to our website, BibleAndTheologyMatters.com, and click on the YouTube link. Well, that's it for now. Until next time, never forget, Bible and Theology Matters, because what you really believe determines how you really behave. Bible and Theology Matters podcast is a listener-supported podcast devoted to helping Christians grow in their knowledge of the Word of God and in their relationship to the God of the Word. To learn how you can partner with the Bible and Theology Matters podcast, visit us at BibleAndTheologyMatters.com. That's Bible, A-N-D, TheologyMatters.com.